Who's locked up? Uh, is that... I think I just saw the blonde hair. It's Ewa. She's looking like a hot mess. Eva's <laughs> confession now. Give me a bit of a backstory, a bit of a flashback. Catch us up. How exactly did it play out after him and... Sorry, not him. Her and Lunga hooked up or linked up. Oh, don't do it. Come on, Eva. Oh... Uh. もう<笑><笑> Uh... <笑>お金ならないわよ。ああ。出てきゃいいんでしょ。それで俺を頼りに来たってわけかい。二度と会わねえって出てったのはそっちだってのによ。久しぶりに会ったんだからお酒くらい飲ませて。おい、エヴァ
<laughs> She's always down for a drink. <laughs> Quite the enforcer. Ah, uh, there's confirmation then. <laughs> Looks like the man's done his research. <laughs> okay, it's gone there now. Loose lips, maybe? Here it comes, here it comes. Of Johan, right? Young Johan? Oh god. <laughs> oh god, look at this. Looks like a giant almost. Imposing figure. <laughs> careful, careful, Eva. Oh my goodness. Look at those brows. Obsession is certainly a reoccurring theme in this. Dusseldorf. But the handsome young man, apparently. Ah. Oh, that's a beautiful, beautiful shot. Interesting design there. My god. And she's about to have her run-in with... the handsome young man. おお。入院しているユンケルさんが言ってた時計ってこれだよ。ああ。すいません。わあ。もう待ち合わせの時間だぞ。しめるもんじゃない。ああ。素敵な腕時計ね。なぜか知らね。ああ、ノー。あの。
Here comes that ring. I hear you. Oh, yeah. He left first. Even though it's- even though it's through a flashback, this is exciting. To see him again. From a different perspective. They are twins after all, but yeah. right then, that is a fantastic episode. Damn good episode. And again, you know, one of the main reasons for that is simply because it's the return of one of the most fascinating and intriguing characters of the story of this anime, Eva. My God, you know, it's, anytime, anytime it's a focus on her, it's just so gripping, right? Because you, you just kind of get to see all of the different faces, all of the different sides of this character, just the immense uh, internal and external struggles that she's facing at the moment and since then. And of course, this episode comes right after the return of Lunge as well, right? So these past two episodes have been really, really fantastic. Right up my alley because, you know, these are two characters that I really, really enjoy, right? These are some of the best of the story. So to get, to get a primary focus on each one of them, it's just perfect, really, right? Um, and, you know, last I saw, they did kind of have this team up. They partnered up. Right, they linked up, kind of. Right, it was certainly presented in that manner, um, but yeah, you know, as of this point, uh, right in the beginning of this episode, the cold open, it appears that she's just been doing her own thing, right? It's a strong case of, um, or a strong showcase of how the mighty have fallen. It's quite the fall from grace for Ava, uh, and you know, it's equal parts pathetic and equal parts really uh, kind of sad. You know, I pity her. I, I do pity her. I don't want to see her in these situations, right? Anytime she'll she'll do something that that is essentially rock bottom, it, it just it just kind of hurt, you know, to see her like that. It could be her being so desperate just for a smoke, for a cigarette. So much so that she'll pick up one that's been discarded by someone. Being so desperate for a drink, right? She's essentially an alcoholic at this point, but being so desperate that she is she is just taking a homeless man's drink. She even hesitates on both occasions before she picks up the discarded cigarette and before she takes a homeless man's drink, his bottle, right? She gives him that look. She's really thinking about this. Uh, and, you know, in those moments, those moments that kind of hold for a few seconds, uh, a tight shot of her face, you can just tell she's thinking, you know, can I sink this low? But she does. She does sink that low. She has essentially hit rock bottom, Right. Um, listen, I'm sure, I'm sure th you can kind of also look at it as a reality check and it is, it's, it's quite a substantial reality check. Her actions led her to this point. They brought her to this point. Uh, her destructive, her self-destructive actions, constantly engaging in self-destructive behavior and activities. It all begins with her, uh, physically burning down her house. And then of course, symbolically just burning down her life at that point. Uh, and now she's kind of left at rock bottom picking up the pieces. I mean, it's crazy to think that the Ava I saw in the beginning stages of this anime um, is now being found uh, blacked out in back alleys associating with uh, wise guys, right? Thugs, mobsters, or maybe he wasn't a mobster, but you know, just his attire and his hair or essentially someone who kind of makes his living uh, through some really questionable means. Let's just say that. So she's associating with these men. Hell, she's even had sex with him before, right? 
um yeah yeah it's 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 an interesting dynamic isn't it because like i said yeah you know you can look at it as a reality check you can look at it as she kind of had it coming because of her really self-destructive behavior but also you know i have a lot of pity for her but yeah let's kind of focus on the ending there inside of that hotel room uh the morning after essentially and then it, it kind of transitions from that flashback right the dual narrative moment um i'll get to that as well and you know like i said you know, I'm usually not a fan of that type of approach because, you know, a lot of times it can kind of be butchered, right? It can all, it can sometimes feel like, oh, okay, you know, this is, you know, episodes and episodes or, art or story arcs down the line. You know, you're going back to a moment and kind of rearranging it or kind of introducing something completely out of the blue, right? It can have that risk or it can run that risk. But I think ultimately it was fine. The use of that was fine in this case. It did kind of end up being interesting seeing it from her perspective at that point, right? Um, but you know, the thing is, actually, hold on, hold on. I'll come back to it. Let me kind of focus on the ending. Because the big man himself, the enforcer, the really creepy Roberto, makes another appearance. Uh, soon after I saw him a few episodes ago. And also he confirms that essentially Mueller, or Mueller, uh, he died, right? He confirms it now. So, yeah, um, you know, at the end there, yeah, he's having a smoke and he's thinking about it, uh, thinking about all the things that played out the night before and essentially comes to the conclusion that so she's seeing Johan. I'll have to kill her. Right. That is his stance at the moment, though. I must admit it was a little bit strange and kind of unnatural that he's saying this out loud because it's just not natural. People don't do that. They don't speak out loud like that right that is something that is a, a bit more suited to something like an internal monologue that would have felt completely natural you know he's having a smoke and he's thinking about it right of, of course us the audience can hear it right but in the context of the show it, it really should have been an internal monologue i think i i think it's a bit unrealistic that he's seeing it out loud especially because he's saying something like oh i'll have to kill her right Though, that being said, is there a bit of hesitation there? Because it really lingers on his face, on his eyes, those dead eyes, right? I don't know, it kind of felt like there was maybe not a moment of hesitation, but maybe he was thinking of another possibility, maybe an opening, right? Um, I mean, the thing is, it's kind of crazy that Ava is here in the first place because, you know, in that flashback, she sees the homie. She sees him. The elusive, the mysterious, Johan face to face he sees her she's only alive because johan does not kill her at that point i believe it's clearly a calculated move on johan's end because that's you know i mean this is a person who saw him not even not even young johan right uh and and of course i'll get to that aspect of it the the picture the photo from the photo album that's missing now i kind of assume that the album must have burnt down altogether maybe uh, and that photo of Johan must have burnt down. But no, 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 it's still around. It's still around. So it's always good to ask these questions about the whereabouts of certain items and important items at that. And even the fact that he stops and he turns and looks at her, presents his face in clear light, even that feels like it's by design. Everything Johan does is calculated and is by design. He lets her see him and then he lets her live. Calculated move, I believe. And I suppose she was able to infer or gather that in, indeed that was that young boy from the photo from the hospital all that time ago. Now he's all grown up, a uh, handsome young man. I suppose she put two and two together. Uh, maybe she saw the resemblance or remembered uh, the boy from the photo. Uh, maybe not, maybe not, because it's not really that important to her. Actually, hold on, let's kind of look at this. How exactly is she able to know for sure that's Johan? I'm trying to think um, if she ever got details of that scene of that moment because you know of course uh, uh sorry what's his name um tenma god damn it <laughs> yeah tenma didn't ever discuss anything like that they barely spoke after that right after after she tried a few times to get back um to get back with uh tenma so she didn't hear anything about that incident that situation so perhaps i'm just to assume that she's intelligent enough to put two and two together and realize that that must have been johan I mean, it's, it is possible. It's just as simple as her remembering the boy from the photo and him having a resemblance to Johan. But, you know, this introduces another really interesting element, doesn't it? She's seen Johan and she knows that that was Johan, right? Again, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, uh, ambiguous how exactly she knows for sure that she's looking at Johan at that point. Um, 
but she knows she knows this johan individual is out there um he exists um and you know these types of people people like roberto are out here right on his behalf essentially you know he is he is quite the effective enforcer you can see he was really quite effective just in his first appearance um but here yeah you see a bit more of that as well but again you know it's never really clear if everything is actually being done because johan asked it to be done going out there and just kind of eliminating any traces of johan's past himself as well right because again you know there's that that bit of deviation that i simply do not think comes from johan you know, he did not ask Roberto to kill Nina or Anna. He did not ask Roberto to go after Dr. Tenma. And of course, over the span of these two uh, appearances, you see, you know, why exactly Johan uh, has him on the payroll, right? Um, yeah, and this man is really quite effective. I mean, he is almost, almost as good as Johan as far as manipulating goes. I mean, the man is a true monster, yet he's able to hide it. Hide it like it's so effortless. Right? He's charming, he's friendly, right? Um, really, really quite attentive and caring. Uh, you see that he really ropes Eva in quite quite easily, quite easily, right? But then at, oh my goodness, you know, that moment, it's like the it's like a flip of the switch moment. It actually gave me a jolt. Like it actually it shocked me, surprised me. Right, because it goes from just like him being really soft spoken and you know just uh, being himself, his fake facade that he's put on, to all of a sudden striking her so hard that she legitimately just goes flying. Right, he's a big man, and you know there's that one really imposing shot of him, you know Ava looking so tiny and delicate, and then you have this bear of a man, or at least in that frame he looks like he's got the stature of a bear who is just this imposing figure above Ava at that moment and you see you really kind of get a feel for how Ava must be feeling in that moment terrified scared for her life and I believe everything she did from that point on is essentially in an effort to protect herself to gain some semblance of control over the situation once again perhaps and you know it's really quite shocking and surprising that indeed they do end up sleeping together but I don't believe for a second there is any any element of consent at that point she's not in a position to give consent this man assaulted her right in in this really brutal and devastating manner she is afraid she's cornered i don't think she's in any position to give consent and there's no chance in hell that she wants to actually sleep with this man come on of course not this man this man could just kill her at any moment at this point in time right after the episode i just don't feel like there's any that she gains any pleasure from doing that at that moment. I, I firmly believe that it's an attempt to protect herself, uh, to save herself, right? There's a consent here. That's my that's my belief at the moment. It's essentially rape. But also going back to that scene, her seeing Johan face-to-face -face in the flesh, she knows this person exists. She knows. She knows Tenma's innocent. And she knows Tenma's not making this up, Right? Is that going to impact um, anything that Ava and Lunga talk about? I mean, at this point, it looked like they're not even in contact, really. That's how I felt like. But yeah, you know, it's always been clear that she knows Tenma is innocent. She knows that. But, you know, there's this case of uh, obsession. You know, two episodes in a row now, I've seen two different people's obsession with Dr. Tenma. You've, you've got Lunga and now you've got uh, Ava. She is so possessive. And, you know, there's a strong case of if I cannot have him, no one else can have him, right? She goes there and she essentially, um, I don't know, scares that lady, Angelica, I believe, uh, the date that Dr. Becker set up. But yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting moment as well because there, you know, it's essentially a mirror to herself. Though I doubt that Angelica is comparable to Ava as far as uh, Ava's explosive personality goes her destructive personality goes right possessive and all that but but you know there's some things that she recognizes in angelica as well from maybe a year or two ago right it's it's almost as if she's putting all of her own insecurities onto angelica right she's projecting at that point and it's almost as if she's speaking to herself at that point 
right? She has this chance to almost face herself. But yeah, you know, by the end of it, she completely sabotaged uh, <laughs> Tenma's date. And you know, the crazy thing is, it's almost kind of like that butterfly effect, isn't it? If she doesn't do that, if she doesn't, you know, scare her off, um, Tenma shows up and she'll be sitting there. And if Tenma shows up, he's not going to be there for Junkers running into that uh, abandoned building or the building that's under construction. I mean, it's becoming a bit of an iconic site at this point. I've seen it twice now from a few different perspectives, right? It's interesting. It's always interesting to see something from a different perspective. So yeah, you know, I didn't really fumble the whole dual narrative aspect of it, going back to a crucial moment, but, you know, introducing a brand new side to it that you simply could not see the first time around. Though I must admit, it was a little bit, it was a little bit strange and maybe a little bit, you know, goofy how close, how closely she was tailing Becker and Tenma. She was like right there. It's kind of, it is kind of silly that they didn't see her. Even, even the scene of her running and yelling after Tenma, it's in the middle of the night. There's no one else out there. It's just Tenma booking it, running after Junkers. So even that felt a little bit, I don't know, unrealistic that Tenma didn't hear her yelling and kind of running after him as well. Though, you know, there must have been a bit of distance between them, I suppose. But still, you know, she is yelling, trying to get his attention. I mean, at that point, she was full-blown stalker, right? <laughs> I mean, she's standing outside of his residence, uh, you know, perhaps a little bit dramatic, you know, standing in the rain, looking up, um, showing up at restaurants, right? Uh, tailing him anytime he's out. It, yeah, it was, it was strange. It was really, again, uh, really shady behavior. You know, the thing is, a lot of her behavior in this episode really reminded me of Cersei Lannister from A Song of Ice and Fire from Game of Thrones. Really quite reminiscent. Uh, I felt, at least. And, you know, Cersei Lannister is an incredible character. One of, one of the best characters in A Song of Ice and Fire in Game of Thrones. And as far as the, the show itself goes, you know, Lena Headey's performance as Cersei Lannister is one of the standouts, one of the greats. But also, as far as performances go, how about Ava's voice acting? Once again, it's so engaging, so fantastic. There's just so much um, life in that, in that voice performance. Uh, my goodness, you know, it's one of the best. It's easily one of the best performances of the entire enemy at this point. But yeah, going back to uh, Roberto's approach with Ava, again, it's kind of ambiguous and not 100% clear that they actually spoke the night before and she actually just doesn't remember because again, you know, uh, because of her substance abuse issues at this point. Even if they didn't speak, of course, it's quite the effective approach by Roberto, right? Because now he finds himself in a position to direct the conversation into the direction he needs it to go into, right? Uh, but, you know, he was around nonetheless. He was clearly tailing her, and he was able to kind of use an opportunity to grab that bag so he can come in and have this opening. But yeah, Roberto is so damn uh, effective out there in the field, right? So effective. I mean, you know, he's essentially the loose ends guy, right? The cleanup guy, the enforcer. And you really do get to see why exactly Johan felt that, yeah, this man is the right man for the job, right? To be this enforcer, the loose ends guy and the cleanup guy and all of that. But again, you know, it's still a little bit ambiguous because I haven't seen any direct conversation or even any sort of um, direction coming to, um, to Roberto from Johan. But also going back to the photo albums and the missing photos of young Johan, as of this point, she hasn't said anything about those photos, right? So he still doesn't know yet. He doesn't have a definitive answer on that just yet. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe Ava has an opening there. Um, listen, here's the thing, folks. Of course, of course, I cannot see any potential Ava death at this point. It, it just doesn't add up. It just wouldn't make sense to kill her off at this point. So she'll get out of it somehow. But yeah, you know, once again, I get to see the many sides of Ava, the many faces of Ava, right? There's so many moments of her really striking and almost evil looking grin as her eyebrows just kind of do that pointy thing, right? And then there's moments of her looking at least really quite um, sincere or at least putting that act on. But then, you know, there's that breakdown moment as her heel breaks. And, you know, at that point, she's just kind of standing there in the rain, finding herself in such a strange situation. Right? She's, at that point, to me, it felt like she's thinking about how her life has just kind of been flipped upside down. And look at her now. Look at me now. I'm out here. Look at me. You know? 
But yeah, you know, it's been established at this point that she can be quite vindictive, fake. She can be bitchy. But but again, below all of that, there's also a person who can be caring, who can be sincere, right? Or at least someone that is clearly capable of all those things, right? So, you know, she continues to be one of the most interesting characters of the show. And one of the characters I'm really quite excited for as far as character arcs and character progressions go, right? So it's a, it's a good episode, folks. Really, really quite the enjoyable episode. And I'm really quite excited for the continuation of this. It's quite the cliffhanger. So if you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you are interested in early access or perhaps even timer-based full length or full opacity, consider checking out the Patreon page. The links are in the description and the pinned comment, also links to social media, things like Twitter and Instagram, if that's your thing. Right then, thank you so much for joining me, folks, and thank you for your time, because time is precious. It really is. And I do hope to see you again soon for episode 24. Until then, take it easy.